This is actually an old one. Um, I went through my notes, and uh, one of the things uh, from the survey you guys did, a couple of things that I've, I've started doing a little bit differently um, is I've gone back to some of my older lectures that I liked a little bit better that don't follow your textbook as much. I know people didn't like that you were going so close to the textbook a little bit. I've also started rearranging stuff on Canvas so all the PowerPoint slides for each topic are on one page and then recorded videos will go on a separate page so you don't have to hunt as hard. It's another thing people would ask for. <coughs> um, but other than that, let's go ahead and get started on memory. So first thing we need to talk about as we talk about memory is there are different stages or different processes in memory. Um, first thing we talk about is encoding. This is how stuff gets into memory. Fairly straightforward. This is the process by which information is transformed into our memories. <coughs> Storage is then, of course, the process by which information is stored in memory or held in memory. We're going to spend most of our time talking about encoding because this is the process we really have the most control over. When you're studying for an exam, you're encoding the material. And so this is really where we can have the most effect on whether or not we remember something later. <coughs> the few areas related to storage really have a lot more to do with things like whether or not you sleep well or sleep at all. So sleep is a really important part of memory formation. And so what's happening while you're sleeping is your experiences are being converted into permanent stored memories. So sleep is a critical part of memory storage. Um, diet and exercise also influence uh, memory storage. That is the health of your brain and hippocampus in particular uh, can influence whether or not you store something permanently. Um, so you want to basically be healthy, sleep, good, you know, good night's sleep, uh, and certainly we know that exercise is associated with things like neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which helps us to form longer-term memories later on. So health is really kind of tied in with memory storage, but other than that, it happens automatically. Retrieval, then, is a process by which stored information is then accessed, brought into conscious awareness, is how we get stuff back out of memory. <coughs> now we s have started to learn that encoding and retrieval are directly related to one another. In fact, you retrieve information using the exact same neural circuitry you use to encode a memory, which is one of the things we saw in that memory hackers video. Um, that is, as memories are formed, they create a circuit, we use that exact same circuit to retrieve information. And every time we retrieve, an, uh, retrieve a memory, it has the potential to be changed a little bit. And that's going to be an important thing we'll talk more about uh, later on today or on Monday. So retrieval and encoding are directly tied in together. We also know that you are most likely to retrieve a memory if you use the same way you encoded it as the way to try to remember it later. That is, encoding and retrieval are all directly tied together in that way as well. We call these encoding-retrieval interactions. And so we'll talk more about that as well. But encoding is where we will spend a pretty good chunk of our time. <coughs> I want to briefly introduce um, one of the things you're going to get in this lecture, and I'm sorry, the next several lectures, a lot of sort of new lingo about how to talk about memory. Um, this is really important as we start talking about different ways in which we can create, commit different memory errors. A memory of omission is when we just forget something, fail to retrieve it, and from a student perspective, probably one of the most important, right? Because you don't want to show up to an exam and then have lots of omissions from your memory. You want to be able to remember things later. <coughs> and so we want to try to you know, not forget as much. Uh, I think forgetting is an important thing. Um, I frankly wouldn't want to remember every day of my life like those um, highly specific autobiographical memory folks or those HCMs they talked about in the video. Um, forgetting is actually an important part of being able to remember things more clearly for most of us. So um, that's omission. Commission is what occurs when we remember something that never really happened or we remember it differently. So these errors primarily occur during retrieval but can occur to encoding processes as well. And in that demonstration we did on Monday when I read out those list of words, you all mostly remembered at least one or two words falsely that I didn't actually read out loud, that's an error of commission. That is, you misremembered 
or retrieves an item from memory that actually wasn't let out, read out loud. We'll talk about the specific mnemonic processes involved in that particular kind of demonstration uh, here in a little bit. But that is an error of commission, where you misremember something. Usually it's because you retrieved the wrong memory or attached the wrong source to it. It's what we call a source monitoring error. Uh, when you go to retrieve a memory, uh, you attach the wrong source to it. So those are errors of commission. These become particularly important when we start talking about things like eyewitness testimony and people's memory for crimes that may or may not be accurate. And so those are particularly problematic. We'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about those, again, either later today or on Monday. <coughs> Before we dive into the details of memory, I want to talk a little bit about working memory. It really isn't any good place. I don't know that your textbook really even talks about working memory that much. Um, so I figured I'd just add it here. Um, working memory sort of replaces what we used to call short-term memory. In fact, a lot of introspect textbooks still talk about short-term memory. Um, but this is a system involved in short-term memory storage, as well as our ability to work with and manipulate information. And in fact, the demonstration we're going to do today has to do with the visual spatial part of working memory. So in the older versions of sort of or views of memory, the short-term store was basically a short-term holding place where you could hold on to information or rehearse it to yourself out loud, that sort of thing, say something to yourself, hold on to information until you could either report it or hopefully then eventually get stuff into longer-term memory. We now think of this more as working memory. Working memory has a number of components. We have a central executive that sort of coordinates and controls uh, working memory. And we'll talk a little bit about what we call executive functions. It also has two uh, subsystems, the phonological loop. This is the traditional thing we thought of as short-term memory long ago, where you give someone a list of digits and then they say them to themselves until they can report them back again. So that phonological loop is how we kind of sort of talking to ourselves. When you're trying to hang on to a piece of information and repeat it over and over to yourself, we've all done that. That's the phonological loop. The phonological loop holds on to a limited amount of information. Uh, if you're an English speaker, you can remember about seven plus or minus two digits. Uh, if you speak uh, Spanish or Hebrew or other languages that have longer digits, in terms of how they're said, the digit span is actually shorter because they take longer to say. So the phonological loop is limited by how much you can say in a certain amount of time, uh, which is a really interesting component. It used to be we thought it was like number of uh, pieces of information, but it's really how you can say things to yourself, uh, which is the reason why digit span is shorter in Spanish, uh, because instead of one, two, three, four, five, you have uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete. That's terrible Spanish. I mean, now I'm limited by Spanish. I can ask where the bathroom is in order up to about nine beers. Um, <coughs> that is all I know in Spanish. Uh, but uh, you can see that there are more syllables in Spanish digits than there are in English digits, and so as a result, it's harder to say numbers to yourself um, by rehearsal. The visual spatial sketch pad is where we work with visual and spatial information. Um, and so we are actually going to do a little demonstration of that. Let's see if I find it. Okay, so the sheets I handed out, you're going to need that for this. This is based on um, some work done by Shepard and Metzler called the Mental Rotation Task. <coughs> um, this guy at Missouri State, Timothy Bender, has some really great demonstrations. I've been using in my cognitive class quite a bit. So they were interested in studying sort of the ability to rotate these three-dimensional shapes. I'm not going to read his stuff out loud. Um, but basically, if you mentally rotate this object this way, actually you can't get it to rotate the correct way uh, because they don't match. Um, so the idea here is you will try to determine whether or not these two are the same object rotated to a different view. Unless I'm completely mistaken, no, they are completely different. So that's going to be your task, is to look at these kind of shapes and determine whether or not they're the same shape or different shape rotated to different views. And it's going to depend on how many degrees of rotation, et cetera, as to how difficult this will be. 
Uh, this task, by the way, let me skip through all this stuff. Um, was developed uh, to test people who want to go to dental school. One of the things that's pretty difficult about being a dentist is you have to be able to visually manipulate things in 3D space. So if you look at a, an x-ray of somebody's tooth, then you have to visualize what that looks like on the other side of their tooth or what side of the tooth it is, etc. So it's a pretty three-dimensional um, type of task. So this one of, the, one of these was sort of designed to like test that. So, um, so in this demonstration, uh, what you're going to see are two lists of 24 pairs of these objects. In the first list, the pairs will be presented at a rate of four seconds per pair. So write four seconds on the first side of your sheet. Uh, in the second, you only get two seconds per pair, which you'll find is very difficult. <laughs> um, even the four seconds is not that easy. Uh, so we expect that you're going to make more errors the further they're rotated, and we'll also expect that you'll make, uh, it'll be much harder to see faster presentation rates. So you'll see two lists of 24 pairs of stimuli, and half the pairs of stimuli will be the same pattern, and half are different. All you have to do is circle same or different uh, on each trial. So if it's the same object rotated to a different view, select same, if it's a different object altogether, then select different. Just circle those on each sheet. So this is an example of the same stimulus rotated 120 degrees. So if you rotate it this way, um, yeah, if you rotate it this way, you'll actually match the same object. You'll see that they're the same object. So that's your task is to do this kind of mental rotation and see if they're the same or different. So these are different stimuli. So if you try to rotate the one around 120 degrees, you can see they don't match. Can you follow me so far? All right, so you've got your response sheet. First list will start on the le next slide. You'll see a fixation point for about two seconds, followed by the first pair. Pair is same, circle same. If the pair is different, circle different. So they'll appear for four seconds each, and a tone will announce the appearance of the next pair of stimuli. All right, and off we go. about how many degrees they were rotated. Um, just go through and score which were correct. 
So, and these are set up the first six, the next six, the six after that, and six after that. So it can be a little bit easier to find if you look that way. Just go through and score how many you got correct out of those 24. No, no, just total number of drinks, yeah. Uh, we don't care about that part. We're not getting that specific. <laughs> this is one of those things, um, it, it's so hard to sort of explain what mental rotation is if I, it's so much easier to just show you and give you a chance for an idea about how difficult this can be. Um, <coughs> on to the next set. This one's going to be uh, the two-second set. So you're going to want to brace yourselves. Pay real close attention because this is going to wing by. Oh. You all ready? All right, here we go. Oh, well, maybe here we go a second. All right, there we go. Go ahead and score that one.
So obviously that'll be the two second condition. Um, give you guys another couple of minutes to finish up scoring that and then I'll get it on top hat. Everybody still scoring? Everybody done? Everybody's done. questions for you there. Um, the four second, the two second, and then I also want to know if you're male or female. The reason for that has to do with this can be a gender loaded task when we start talking about gender here in a couple weeks. I want to look back at our data and see what we find. Um, you know, just for fun. to the phonological, or sorry, the visual spatial sketch pad, that ability to manipulate visual and spatial information. <coughs> In addition to um, the sort of shorter term storage systems like the visual spatial sketch pad where we work visual, visual and spatial information, um, we have what's called the central executive, and sometimes this is talked about as executive functioning. And executive functioning is essentially our ability to work with and manipulate information and be able to do things like plan for the future, <coughs> um, integrate past, present, and future together, uh, be able to use previously learned information to drive future behavior. Uh, and it's an important ability um, that can uh, be damaged uh, in people who have uh, frontal lobe head injury, uh, who have any sort of frontal or prefrontal area damage, uh, and can oftentimes be very debilitating because they can't sort of plan and control for future actions. So a classic um, test of this kind of basic sort of overall executive functioning, something called the Wisconsin card sorting task. Basically, the people who are being tested have to sort cards into piles based on three attributes, color, number of items, or the shape of items on the card. Uh, and what happens is the person who's giving the test will simply tell them whether they've sorted things correctly or not. So they have to test whether or not uh, to figure out if they're sorting on the correct attribute. And then the person giving the test will switch the attribute and not tell them. Well, a person who has a, a, some sort of executive functioning deficit can't learn that they have done something wrong, and so they keep trying the same thing over and over again. We call it a perseverative error. They keep trying the same thing over and over again because they can't use information from previous trials to help them out on future trials. And so it's one of the problems with people who have this kind of head injury can be fairly debilitated by that. So that's working memory. Um, <coughs> my cognitive students, I made them do this thing called the operation span um, that involves remembering letters and doing math at the same time. And I'm not going to make you guys do that because uh, it's not as much fun as the mental rotation. Um, it's far less fun, as a matter of fact. Uh, but let's get into talking about longer term memory systems. And here we start talking about some distinctions between different types of memory. <coughs> and these are kind of sliced up in a variety of different ways depending on who you talk to. Um, so we have the what we call explicit-implicit distinction. And as explicit memories are memories for which 
we have conscious awareness of the fact that we're remembering something. It's pretty simple. So we're aware of having retrieved information, and we have conscious memory of that. So these are explicit memories. Your textbook probably calls these declarative memories, because that's um, Shacker's uh, way to talk about these. So explicit memories and declarative memories are, for the most part, interchangeable. Implicit memories are memories without conscious awareness. So the memories without awareness, or they're unconscious memories, there's no conscious or deliberate attempt at remembering. <coughs> so explicit memories are fairly straightforward. What you did yesterday is what we call an episodic memory. Um, do you know what the capital of Maine is? That would be a semantic memory. These are things that you can consciously um, retrieve and be aware of. Your ability to ride a bicycle is an impl implicit memory. That is, you don't consciously retrieve how to balance and ride a bike down the street. You just get on it and go and do it. Uh, because there's no conscious or deliberate attempt at remembering. If you try to attempt to remember how to ride a bike while you're riding a bike, you'll be very bad at it. In fact, you'll probably fall off. Uh, these are things that happen automatically with no conscious intent or conscious awareness of what you've actually, of all the processes involved. Uh, other types of implicit memory are things like, um, we talked about subliminal processing or sub subliminal perception. There are some studies in there that show that your recent experience can bias your current memory. Um, other types of implicit memory, if you remember in the Memory Hackers video we watched on Monday, they talked about patient HM, Henry Mollison, um, and Barbara Milner's work with uh, getting HM to learn how to do mirror tracing, which is really quite difficult, um, where you, the only thing you can see is your hand in the mirror, so everything's backwards. Well, HM got very good at doing that, but had no conscious memory of having done so. So his ability to complete that kind of task is an implicit memory. In fact, HM got very good at other kinds of puzzles as well, even though he had no explicit memory of having done so. So while he wasn't consciously aware of having done so, he did have the ability to actually learn these kind of new tasks. In fact, patient HM is really the um, point at which we start making this explicit-implicit distinction. So other ways in which we think about memory, declarative and non-declarative memory are sometimes explicit and implicit memory. The declarative memory is when cognitive information is retrieved from explicit memory. So this is episodic memory and semantic memory. <coughs> These are both types of sort of explicit or declarative memories. Uh, there are implicit or unconscious sort of bits in episodic memory and semantic memory as well. This is why sometimes this is a difficult distinction to make in trying to figure out what goes into what categories. But episodic memories are memories for our past and experiences, like what you did yesterday, what you had for breakfast, what happened a minute ago. Those are all episodic memories. Semantic memories is our knowledge. It's our knowledge about the world. Episodic memories are context dependent. That is, they are linked to what we call spatial temporal context specific times and places, or life episodes. Semantic memory is knowledge which has no contextual properties with it whatsoever. So while you can all tell me who the first president of the United States was, that would be your semantic memory, none of you can tell me when and where you were when you learned that fact, because you don't have an episodic memory for learning that information. What's important about that is your episodic memories become your semantic memories for things like knowledge. So knowing that George Washington was the first president of the United States is part of your semantic memory. At some point, you came home from school and said, I learned who the first president of the United States was, and so you had an episodic memory for that. Those details have long since gone, but the knowledge is still there. So one of the goals of education is to get you to learn independent of context. <coughs> so sometimes when we talk about implicit memory, we're often talking about the process by which people show enhanced memory performance without any deliberate effort or awareness. So their recent experience demonstrates that they have been able to learn without having any conscious awareness of having done so. One frequently cited type of implicit memory is procedural memory. And these are things like motor skills, habits, 
playing the piano, playing tennis, <coughs> driving a car, riding a bicycle. All these are types of procedural memories for which you don't have to consciously access information to accomplish them. Right? You can get in the car and drive it without consciously remembering how to do so. That's the reason why people get better at driving because it requires less and less effort. Other things like playing tennis, playing an instrument, walking, talking, these are all types of procedural memories. Uh, there's a very famous um, amnesia patient by the name of Clive Waring. Clive had a terrible case of viral encephalitis <coughs> back in the 1980s. Clive was a conductor with the BBC. And um, uh, Clive's still alive, but as a result of his very bad viral encephalitis, uh, he has no memory, he has no conscious memory at all of his past or his anything that's happened. Basically, he lives in the last 30 seconds. Um, if somebody walks out of the room and comes back in, it's like he's never seen them before um, or hasn't seen them in ages. So he only has that sort of very brief memory. But if you sit him down at the piano, he can still play the piano. Even though he doesn't remember ever having done so, and he'll tell you he doesn't know how to play the piano, he can sit down and actually play. So it's really remarkable um, that how different procedural memory is from other types of memory. So the kind of things we're talking about, again, this is that mirror tracing task we were talking about, um, things like playing golf. All of these are skills that we accomplish without conscious awareness. Any questions about these basic ideas? So these are um, different types of memory systems. Uh, you'll see I have up here, we're talking about evidence for different types of memory systems. Pretty much everyone's settled on the fact that this is all true. Um, <coughs> but I do want to talk about some of the history there. Yeah. Of what? Declarative memory is basically the same thing as explicit memory. Anything that you can declare out loud is really declarative memory. That's why it's called that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, for some reason, cognitive psychology has to name everything twice. So <laughs> explicit memory and declarative memory are basically the same thing. Yeah. Don't ask me why. Because every time, I, whenever I teach cognition, I'm like, well, some people will call it this and some people will call it that, but it's the same thing. Stupid. Um, <coughs> of course, I'm going to post this lecture to YouTube and hear from it from cognitive psychology con uh, people. Anyway, um, <laughs> did that answer your question? Oh, <laughs> yes, okay. Sorry, we wander off topic for a second. So we're going to talk a little bit about amnesia. We'll probably on Monday talk uh, about a little bit more how all this uh, works in terms of the brain and memory. But there are two different, primarily two different types of amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is an inability to remember the past. Retrograde amnesia is really rare. In fact, um, total retrograde amnesia, the sort of what I call soap opera memory where somebody shows up and can't remember who they are, almost never happens. And it's usually not even due to brain damage. It's usually due to um, some sort of psychogenic uh, amnesia. More and more common is anterior grade amnesia. An anterior grade amnesia is an inability to encode new information into memory. This is usually due to damage to the medial temporal lobe, in particular the hippocampus. Patient HM that we saw a little bit about in the Memory Hackers video um, had very dense anterior grade amnesia uh, because of his temporal lobe epilepsy surgery that removed both his left and right temporal lobes along with most of his left and right hippocampus. <coughs> Patients in both cases typically show normal working memory capacity and intact knowledge. Um, patient HM remembered everything from before his surgery, but nothing after. His surgery was in 1959, as I recall, uh, and he died in 2008, 2009, 10, somewhere in there, um, relatively recently. So he lived for over 50 years, um, well, 60 years, with no memory the last 50 years. Interestingly, though, he did pick up some knowledge. Like, he knew who Richard Nixon was. Um, he knew who Jimmy Carter was, but couldn't ever place them in the right sort of temporal context. Um, did I tell you 
has this story that there, there was an article I saw the other day um, where ER doctors are having this issue. One of the questions they ask people to see if they have amnesia is who the current president is. I think I told my cognitive class this. Well, ER doctors now are suddenly having to break the news that Donald Trump is president to people with amnesia. Um, and it's a really funny article. I'll have to see if I can find it. Uh, it's a really funny article because the guy said, <laughs> so one guy said, uh, the ER said, God, I voted for him, but I didn't think he'd win. Um, and then somebody was just refused to believe it outright. So it's kind of funny. Um, anyway, that's anterior grade amnesia. Um, just a funny little side note. <coughs> um, so these amnesia patients provide evidence that there are different parts of memory and different kinds of memory. Again, the amnesia patients show that there are explicit and implicit distinction. In some of my work, we're actually able to very temporarily induce anterograde amnesia in patients using a drug called Versed or midazolam, and then test their explicit and implicit memory. So it's very clear that these are different types of memory. Um, we also see um, patients can have deficits in working memory and executive functioning. These are by far the most common type of brain injury. Um, usually due to what we call MTBI or mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, this is usually uh, close, some sort of closed head trauma, car accident, sports injury. Uh, what we used to really call concussion uh, is uh, this MTBI. What happens with this kind of injury is you're, we're not built to go 80 miles an hour and come to sudden stops. Um, we're certainly not meant to collide our heads together in sports competitions. Uh, our brains are floating in liquid, which is a pretty good way to protect something if you know you have relatively low levels of force. So you can't cause yourself a brain injury by you know smacking your head back and forth. I don't recommend it, but it's not likely to happen. Um, <coughs> what happens when you get into a car accident, for example, is you and your brain are traveling at 60 miles an hour, and then your skull stops, and then your brain stops after it run, runs into your skull. So you're the two are sort of traveling independently because it's floating. And so that force causes your brain to hit the front of your skull, the back of your skull, and that's usually what causes that kind of injury, which is why the injuries are usually to this part of the brain, which is primarily the frontal lobe. This causes diminished working memory, diminished judgment, attention, concentration, can cause emotional difficulties. Uh, these are all generally due to this kind of uh, brain injury. It causes what's called diffuse axonal shearing, um, where they disconnect different parts of the brain. Uh, it can be very traumatic. <coughs> the uh, thing that happens also with this kind of traumatic brain injury is you can get what we call temporally graded amnesia. Because the brain's injured um, for, you know, at the time of the injury, what happens is people lose a few days prior and a few days after, um, they lose that part of their memory because their brain's not able to consolidate those experiences. Um, sometimes it can be weeks or even months of time that they lose both before and after their injury. Usually it starts to get better over time. The biggest predictor of memory loss is if you lose consciousness in the amount of time uh, someone's unconscious. That's a really a bad sign in terms of overall prognosis. <coughs> Some other implicit explicit distinctions that we'll talk about. Um, we saw the uh, case of Henry Mollison with his severe anterior grade amnesia uh, following his uh, surgery. Again, HM demonstrated that he had access to newly learned experiences. He could learn to do all sorts of new things, but he had no conscious awareness of ever having done so. As I mentioned a little while ago, um, Clive Waring, very famous case study in which um, he has has very severe anterior grade and retrograde amnesia, but he can still play the piano. He still recognizes his wife. It's really remarkable. The videos are actually quite touching to watch uh, because it just lights up when his wife walks into the room. Um, sort of illustrating that the emotional content of memory is probably a little bit different uh, as well. In some of my research, uh, we use a drug called midazolam, or at least used to. I haven't done this research in a while, uh, where Participants are, sorry, patients are usually given this drug for um, surgery. Basically, they're put on a pretty steady dose of midazolam during surgery, so if they wake up, they don't remember having woken up. Um, really safe drug to use, relatively safe, I should say. 
Um, we used much lower doses, so people were men conscious, were able to answer questions, do all sorts of things, um, and then had pretty much no memory for having done so later. About an hour and a half later after the drug had worn off, uh, we would test them and their memory performance was in the two and three percent. In fact, <coughs> a number of participants said to me uh, they couldn't figure out why I was asking questions <laughs> about these things, even though they had spent you know, quite a bit of time studying them previously. So what we see in that midazolam research is while their conscious memory has been affected, their unconscious forms of memory are still intact. So it sort of demonstrates this explicit implicit distinction. Any questions before we move on to talking about different kinds of processing and memory? Well, those are the different types of memory systems. This is really about how we encode information into memory. <coughs> um, and certainly this is something we talked about the very first day of class, so some of this will be kind of reaching back into what we talked about on the first day on uh, study habits and study strategies. Uh, the first thing, of course, is what we call maintenance rehearsal is a terrible strategy for trying to remember things later. This is when you simply do basic rote memorization where you just repeat stuff to yourself. Um, there's lots of research demonstrating that maintenance rehearsal is not an effective study strategy. Elaborative rehearsal is when we work with information in working memory. So we try to process information in working memory using meaning-based information, visualization, any way in which we can elaborate on memory uh, helps improve uh, the memory for that later. So elaborative rehearsal is a much more uh, effective strategy, uh, certainly something we've already talked uh, quite a bit about uh, on the first day of class. So elaborating on material, essentially collaboration is when we take, use our working memory resources to tie what we're trying to remember to stuff we already know or are interested in. So we try to picture it by using that visual spatial sketch pad. We try to uh, tie it in with things we already know, tie it in with definitions of information we know. We use the phonological store for that. And we use our central executive to try to tie all this information to try to remember it later. <coughs> uh, we've talked already. Uh, just you can sort of put a little note here to look back to uh, the study strategy lecture about the spacing effects we've talked about already, the generation effects. You generate things from memory. You're much more likely to remember them later. Basically, the take-home message is how we learn information, how we study is much more important than how much we study. That's the basic take home message from that. <coughs> Previously in the semester, we did a little demonstration on what's called the levels of processing effect. Um, <coughs> the idea here uh, in levels of processing, and I'll show you the results and you'll probably start to remember a little bit. Uh, the idea is that the deeper you process information, the better your memory will be. So we did this demonstration in which um, you got a sentence, is it in upper or lower case, or is it in large letters, does it rhyme with, or does it fit into the following sentence, you guys remember that? Um, basically the idea behind levels of processing is the deeper you process information, the more likely you are to remember it later. So subjects are given this orienting sentence, does it rhyme with dog, does it, is it in upper or lower case letters, does it fit into a sentence, does it fit into a category, and the idea behind the levels of processing uh, theory is the deeper you process information, the more likely you are to remember it later. And it's basically that meaning-based processing is a better type of memory. Excuse me. I'm just taking a drink. Roasting up here. Sure my hair is really cute too. All right. Um, so that is the basic idea behind levels of processing. So if you remember, upper or lowercase letters, memory was worse. Uh, rhyming, maybe a little bit better, and semantic processing, a little bit better. And in fact, you can actually go back and look at your data. You go back to upper or lowercase. Most people remembered one or two items. Rhyme, you know, also about one or two, and in the sentence condition, 
more like four items. So you guys fit this pattern uh, pretty well in your data as well. Take-home message, meaning-based processing is always better. <coughs> the next sort of step up from levels of processing has to do with what's called the encoding specificity principle. The encoding specificity principle is trying to um, answer more important questions like why is it that meaning-based processing results in better memory? Uh, and what about different types of retrieval? That is, does retrieval matter as much as other types of encoding? So, brief rundown on how these experiments were done. Um, participants study word pairs that were either associated with meaning or associated with a rhyme, and then they were studied, they were tested with either some sort of meaning-based cue or some sort of rhyming cue. This is actually a demonstration I've done in class. This is actually from one of my classes. What they find, it, what we found in my previous classes is when you study something based on how it rhymes and then are tested with an actual rhyme cue, or study something based on its meaning and tested with a meaning-based cue, performance is best in those two conditions. That is, it's the match between encoding and retrieval that really matters the most. Uh, this is one of those demonstrations I've done, but it's quite boring, so I just opted not to do it in this class. Um, it takes quite a bit of time. <coughs> but basic take-home message here is that whether or not an item is retrieved depends on the match between encoding and retrieval conditions. So matching encoding and retrieval results in the best type of performance. Well, the reason why meaning-based processing results in better memory in the levels of processing effect is that's how we, we, re we retrieve information by default. Our memories work based on meaning. We don't retrieve things based on rhymes or whether they're in upper or lowercase letters, but that's how we actually retrieve things is based on their meaning. That's why elaborative encoding, meaning-based, thinking about the meaning material is so important when it comes to your own studying because that's how our memory works. Our memory defaults to using a meaning-based retrieval strategy. <coughs> so that's why matching how you study with how you're going to be tested is so important. So if you remember back to the very first day, one of the things that I told you is when you're studying for an exam, think about whether or not it's an essay test and try to think about what kind of task are you going to have to do and how can I study for that task? Same thing with the multiple choice test. What am I actually going to have to do? Well, the thing I'm going to have to do is be able to determine the difference between related concepts be able to identify the correct concept. And so studying should be a little bit different for those two kinds of exams. You shouldn't use the exact same kind of study strategy. So this idea of matching encoding and retrieval has been extended to quite a few different realms. So this kind of encoding retrieval interaction. Um, very old study by Smith et al. Uh, found that if you match the room of study with the room of test, marginal performance improvements, but I don't suggest studying here because it's, it's not enough improvement to make you suffer through trying to study in this room. Um, there's more modern research um, by Rich Marsh and uh, his colleagues uh, where they looked at, this is particularly important for things that are new, uh, but again, very marginal benefits. Uh, much more interesting, at least to me, is the study by Godin and Badalay where they went into a scuba diving class and tested the students in the scuba diving class on land and underwater. And what they found is if they studied on land and were tested on land, performance was at its best. So you should probably study for your exam on land. But if you, for some reason, feel the need to study underwater, I guess you know, you're going to have problems because I can't give your exam underwater. Um, <laughs> but what you can see, it's this match between conditions at study and conditions at test that are driving performance. That is, this kind of context is a really important part of how we learn. That is, by matching context. This is so important that NASA spends hundreds of millions of dollars training astronauts in simulated weightless environments. 
So for example, they have this giant neutral buoyancy tank contained within it replicas of parts of the International Space Station. So that when astronauts go to the International Space Station, they know how to interact with the components in a somewhat weightless environment because that neutral buoyancy tank somewhat simulates weightlessness. And so they're able to learn how to manipulate things, learn the controls in a similar environment to that in which they'll have to be doing things um, when they're actually on the International Space Station. The only way they're able to do that is the only other way to simulate weightlessness is parabolic flight, uh, where they fly up and then fly straight down. And they do that over and over again, um, which is why they call it the vomit comet. Uh, plane they do that in. Apparently, it's very unsettling to your stomach, I can imagine. Anyone who's driven a roller coaster knows that weightless feeling, right? <coughs> um, one of the other areas this comes up in is what we call state dependent memory. Uh, first thing I want to tell you about this figure I'm about to put up is for some reason, the investigators decided memory errors were the thing to plot, so the higher bars are worse memory. So here we have people are encoding while sober or intoxicated with alcohol, and being tested while they're sober or intoxicated with alcohol. You can see lowest memory errors in the sober-sober condition. I want to emphasize that a great deal. Um, performance is best here, but you can see the performance is the by far the worst when you encode something while intoxicated and retrieve it while sober. Most drugs have some kind of state-dependent learning effect. And alcohol is certainly one of those. Um, you guys are all, of course, too young to drink, so I'm going to assume none of you know anything about going out with your friends and me seeing somebody that you met the last time you were drinking and then a couple drinks into it go, oh, I remember them now. But you haven't had that happen. Um, this also actually, I should say, these state-dependent effects hold up for tobacco. So nicotine has state-dependent effects. Uh, marijuana has limited state-dependent effects. And um, caffeine has pretty strong state-dependent effects. So matching conditions at encoding with conditions at retrieval is an important part of managing sort of your study life. So we want to be sober. If you drink coffee when you study, have some coffee with the exam. If you smoke, I have to get you a patch or some gum because I won't let you smoke in here. Um, yeah, and then you're on your own if you're going to smoke a joint. Sorry. Um, I don't like to pry, <laughs> but you should probably do your best to study sober and test your sober. Questions on that? I think currently I used to do this. I think the last time I taught, used this lecture, it was in a 50 minute class. Which explains why I've gotten to this point. <coughs> okay, well, I want to move on to talking about the act of retrieval itself. Um, this is something they talked a great deal about in the Memory Hackers video. Uh, incidentally, if anyone wasn't here, there's a link to it on Canvas. Um, I highly recommend watching it, too. Um, <coughs> but retrieval is a key process. Whenever we retrieve a memory, we actually have the ability to change that memory, kind of like opening a file on your computer. Um, because we're essentially using the same neural circuitry that creates the memory to retrieve the memory. So whenever we, we remember an event, it's reconstructed based on those neural connections. It's not reproduced, it is reconstructed. So whenever we remember something, we're actually piecing it back together. And it's really important to understand because this reconstructed process can go awry pretty easily. And we'll take a look at some of the um, research in this area. So one thing to understand is that memory for events is rarely veridical. And veridical means an exact copy of the experience. Um, memory is actually more like an approximation of events. One thing that's really important to know is our memories are very self-serving and self-biased. That is, we all think the world revolves around us. Not, not just you, everybody thinks the world kind of revolves around us, and so our memories are always from our perspective. And so our role in events is oftentimes overinflated in our memories. What happens is always from our own perspective. And so that can really alter our memories quite a bit. There's some really interesting studies of uh, the Nixon era, in which it's one of those rare instances where history has an exact account 
of what happened in the White House because of uh, they were tape recording everything that happened in the Oval Office. And so if you look at people's testimony or their descriptions of events in their you know, memoirs, etc., they always overinflate their own roles in what happened if you compare them to what was happening in the actual tape. And so people's memories are always a little bit biased. Okay, so we did this demonstration on Monday. I read the list of words out loud um, that were all related to certain words, needle, doctor, etc. <coughs> and that demonstration is what we call the Heath, Rodiger, and McDermott paradigm. Um, I don't have Mr. Heath. Uh, his paper came out in the 50s. Uh, Roddy and Kathy came out with their paper in 1994 probably one of the most dramatic alterations in sort of the trajectory of memory research is a uh, publication of this paper. Uh, Roddy and Kathy were both in that uh, Memory Hackers video on Monday. So what's happening in that demonstration is as I was reading those lists of words out loud, they were all related to those one, what I call critical lure words. So those are the words I put up on the board um, that I actually didn't read out loud, that many of you remembered a number of. What happens during those study lists while I'm reading out <coughs> uh, physician, stethoscope, patient, hospital, cure, et cetera, all of those are related to the word doctor. And every time I read one of those words, you get this what we call implicit associative response. That is, you automatically think of that associated word. So, when I say physician, you think doctor. When I say needle, you think doctor. When I say hospital, you think doctor. Um, that's happening automatically, and it's happening at an, at an unconscious level. That's why it's called an implicit response. It's an associative response because the words are all associated. So it kind of looks like this. So this is the word needle. You start reading these words out loud, and you start thinking of the word needle. More and more and more and more and more and more. So that when you get to the point where you try to remember what was on the study list, this item has as much memory associated it with it as the items that were actually read out loud. And so when you go to write them down, you go, oh, needle, thread, knitting, odd, sewing. And then you go on to it. What's happened is when you go to retrieve that memory and you reconstruct the experience, this seems awfully familiar, and so you say, God, I know that word was read out loud. And so you write it down, thinking it was one that was on the study list, when in fact, it wasn't. This is what we call a source confusion. That is, you've confused the source of the memory, that is, that internal implicit associative response, with an actual external experience. <coughs> and we refer to this as a source monitoring error. Source memories are really important part of how our memories work, and it's kind of a little bit off to the side research area, but it's really important in terms of accurately identifying where our information comes from in our memory. So what's happening in this uh, is you tend to match that internal response with the person that was reading it out loud, which in this case was me. In some studies, they had them actually read those, they had a male read half the list and a female read the other half of the list, and then subjects were asked to identify which person read the actual word, and they actually say that the word that wasn't read out loud was read by the person who read that list. So we get this sort of source monitoring error where we misidentify the source of a memory. Has anyone had a parent or grandparent try to start telling a story about one of your siblings, and they put you in? instead of one of the siblings, or somehow they get the people confused in those. Yeah, it happens all the time. That's a basic source monitoring error. They don't remember what the source of the memory was, um, but they remember somebody did something wrong, so you get blamed later on. So all of this demonstrates that memory for an event is reconstructed. That internal event becomes part of the reconstruction of the experienced event, and that includes some perceptual detail. This is a really important applied question when we start trying to figure out things like accuracy in eyewitness testimony, um, accuracy in memory for even committing a crime, which we saw 
also in the Memory Hackers video, people can actually start to create memories of events that never happened based on internal processes. So if you remember, one of the things they had, uh, she had participants do in that study was that she had them imagine being at the age, being in the place, being with the person, all those details that were correct, and then have them imagine getting in the fight. Well, this is a part of memory research called imagination inflation. That is, when you imagine doing something, you are much more likely to remember having done it, even though you haven't done so. And this is much more susceptible the younger you are. Younger kids are really susceptible to imagination inflation. <coughs> so we misattribute that imagined experience with one that actually happened. Um, any questions on that? I want to talk about schemas. Uh, I didn't uh, bring this demonstration either because it's a little bit esoteric and hard to figure out. Uh, I might see if I can find a better one for Monday. Um, but one of the things that can influence our memory uh, are these knowledge structures or cognitive architectures we call schemas. And schemas are um, this cognitive structure that allows us to perceive and remember um, organize, process, and use information in ways uh, that make it more efficient so that we don't have to remember every single experience and all of its details because we can use the schema to help guide our retrieval. So schemas are things like, what do you do when you go to a restaurant? It's basically the same thing, right? If it's a sit-down restaurant, you walk up and wait for some snotty person to take you or some overly cheerful person, depending on what kind of restaurant you're going to, right? Um, the more expensive it is, the snottier they are. The cheaper it is, the more overly cheerful the person treating you will be. Um, <coughs> so somebody will seat you. Somebody will bring you water. And if you're at a Mexican restaurant, maybe some chips and salsa. You order margaritas or whatever it is. You order drinks. Then you'll order food. Somebody will arrive. It's basically what happens every time you go to a restaurant. When you take an exam, typically all very similar. First day of class, um, going to the dentist. You go to the dentist, you're going to brush your teeth obsessively, and then you'll go, and then you'll sit and wait and read through Highlights Magazine, try to find the toaster in the tree, and then you'll go get your teeth cleaned, and, and the dentist will come in for two seconds, and then you'll either come back or not, right? That's what happens at the dentist's office. Well, these schemas allow us to more efficiently process information. They guide our behavior because they tell us how to act in certain situations, but they can also lead us astray. So in a number of experimental uh, studies, they've looked at how schemas can alter our memory for events. So the oldest really classic study in this is by um, Bartlett back in the 1930s who did this uh, study uh, in Great Britain, using a Native American folktale called The War of the Ghosts. And they had participants read the folktale, and then they came back and tried to relate all of the details of The War of the Ghosts to Bartlett. What he found is participants made some systematic errors. Uh, they oftentimes substituted what was in the tale for things that they were more familiar with. So the seal hunting trip in the War of the Ghosts becomes a fishing expedition in their recall. Um, canoe becomes boat. So these basic alterations in the memory for this folk tale that are through the lens of their own experiences, so their own schemas. So they use their, their cognitive architecture to try to process the information itself and to try to retrieve it itself. One of the important lessons, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about um, stereotyping is we use our beliefs about the world to process information. We use it to encode and bring in information and to retrieve it as well. And so oftentimes it can sort of reinforce things like stereotypes. So Gordon Bauer did this other very clever study on uh, memory for schema consistent versus schema inconsistent items. <coughs> and essentially uh, the gist of this study is um, they read uh, some sentences about 
and going to the dentist or a convenience store robbery, say, um, and then they were tested for their memory for items that were not presented, but either consistent with the schema or inconsistent with the schema. So in the going to the den dentist, there might be no mention of the dental hygienist, but then there's a sentence about a dental hygienist in the test. People were more likely to say that was part of the original um, information given uh, than not. Uh, something like a convenience store robbery, uh, the schema consistent item might be the presence of a gun, and there wasn't one, but people would misremember that. Schema inconsistent items are things like a dental hygienist at the convenience store robbery, that doesn't make any sense. Um, or a gun at the dentist's office, right? Those things we would remember. Um, but the take home message from this is our memories can oftentimes we can add and subtract things from our memories based on whether or not they're consistent with our schema about the world. And that certainly can become very problematic, particularly when we're starting to talk about things like eyewitness testimony, jurors in a trial. They oftentimes will misremember trial information based on their schemas about the trial itself. All right, well, we're done a couple minutes early, but we will pick up here on Monday. Other than that, have a good weekend and try to stay warm. It's fairly ridiculous outside.